Welcome to The World Today, a program of Perry Worldhouse, the University of Pennsylvania's global affairs think tank. I hope everyone is safe and healthy. I'm Michael Horowitz, professor of political science and director of Perry Worldhouse. Today's guest is Professor Susan Weiss. Susan Weiss is professor and vice chair of the Department of Microbiology and co-director of the Penn Center for Research on Coronaviruses and Other Emerging Pathogens at the Perlman Medical School, at the Perlman School of Medicine at the University of Pennsylvania. His long, her long-term research interests are in, are in marine and human coronaviruses with a current focus on virus uh, interaction with host innate immune response. I think I said that right, hopefully. You did, you did. <laughs> Professor Weiss, thank you for joining us today at Perry Worldhouse. And the floor is yours to, to teach us all about, uh, about coronaviruses and this pandemic that we've all been experiencing uh, over the last several months. Okay, thank you. Um, it's nice to speak to a non-science audience for once, actually. Um, so I'm, I am going to talk about the history of coronaviruses, but let's start with what happened at the end of 2019 when a novel or new coronavirus emerged in China. And as we all know now, we're living with the pandemic that it, that it caused. And uh, pretty soon after it emerged, I mean, really soon, it was identified as a coronavirus and it was named SARS-CoV-2, SARS coronavirus 2. So it's important, that's the name of the virus. The disease is COVID-19, the virus is SARS-CoV-2. Mm -hmm. And the reason it was named that is it's genetically really similar to the original SARS virus, which emerged also in China in 2000, at the end of 2002. Um, so I, I don't think anyone really knew or heard much about coronaviruses until SARS, until the first SARS epidemic, which I sometimes call that virus SARS-1 or the original SARS. So, um, but really there are many, many coronaviruses that infect all kinds of species of animals as well as humans. So I thought I would just give a kind of short history of coronavirus or coronavirus research really dating back from the time in the late 70s, early 80s. So. Um, and this is sort of co corresponds to when I came to Penn, which is I started as an assistant professor in 1980, and I decided to, that my independent research was going to be on coronaviruses, which was really a new field at the time. So at that point, we knew that there were two human cold viruses, 2290 and OC43, that were coronaviruses. You probably hear about them now. They've become more well known now that we know about SARS. So there were also all these animal viruses like uh, chicken virus, bovine, pig, um, and, the, and these were viruses that there was a lot of research done on, particularly um, in the trying to develop vaccines. Uh, and, and then the other virus that a lot of people worked on that I worked on was mouse hepatitis virus, which is a model coronavirus. So we use it as a model to study hepatitis, encephalitis, and demyelinating diseases, and now also a SARS-like syndrome in mice. So, so it's really nice to study this virus because it, it, it causes, it's a natural infection of mice. Uh, and we can learn a lot about, uh, about uh, both the pathogenesis and the replication of the virus. So then um, from about 1980 to about 2002, when SARS emerged, uh, there, were, there was a small but, but intense group of people working on these viruses. And we learned a lot about how they entered cells, how they replicated. They have a very complicated way of making their RNA and proteins. We learned how clever they were in um, antagonizing host cell responses. Um, and, and then, so then when, um, when SARS emerged in 2002, it was amazingly fast how quickly it was identified as a coronavirus by actually by its morphology that's spike-like, what we call the crown-like morphology formed by the spikes that I think everybody's heard about already, the, the proteins. On the we've seen, we've seen them on TV. That's right. And so you can imagine, just as an aside, as a coronavirologist to work on this obscure virus and see your virus on television is pretty amazing, actually. Okay, so SARS happened, and um, a couple things, interesting things happened. We learned that SARS originated in a bat and was transmitted to a civet as an intermediate species and then to humans. So that was pretty amazing. Um, and also, so at that time too, people started looking for bats, for viruses in bats and found lots of coronaviruses in lots of bats in Asia, not so much here, although there are coronaviruses um, in bats in the US, although they're not the SARS-like viruses. The other thing that happened after SARS was that people realized that, um, that there were, people looked for other coronaviruses and found a couple other human coronaviruses, non-lethal ones. 
Um, it's also important to remember that SARS lasted for seven months. It was this horrible epidemic. It mostly stayed in Asia, but in many parts of Asia, mostly in China and Hong Kong. And it also went to Toronto via someone traveling from Hong Kong, I think, to Toronto. But it was done in seven months. So all the millions of people, not millions, but many researchers that streamed in to work on coronaviruses at that time soon left. And then the field was quiet. Then 2012, we get another MERS, Middle East Respiratory Syndrome coronavirus emerged in Saudi Arabia, um, causing another epidemic, which this epidemic was a little different. It's still happening. It turns out that MERS came from bats, moved to camels, where it has a reservoir, and then from camels to humans. And there are still a couple of MERS cases a week, I'm told by a colleague. Um, in, and it's restricted really to Saudi Arabia, which is kind of interesting because camels carry this virus both in Saudi Arabia and Africa, but there are no cases in Africa. So it's kind of a mystery. So again, so 2012, some people moved in to work on it and they moved out. And then things were pretty quiet in coronavirus land until the end of 2019, when of course we know that SARS, I mean SARS-2 emerged in Wuhan, um, causing up to, I think, 400,000 deaths worldwide. Um, and we're pretty sure that SARS came from a bat, SARS-2 came from a bat, but we haven't identified its parental species. And we don't know, we assume also, or we presume that there's probably an intermediate species like the civet or the camel, but that has not been identified yet. So we know a lot about the disease that it causes, although there's still a lot we don't know, but we really don't know its origins, except that we presume it's like the other uh, lethal coronaviruses that it came from bats. So. Um, I guess I'll stop here and uh, maybe um, Mike can ask me some questions. That's, that, that's perfect. And, and I, I'm already learning from this interaction. And I actually want to jump in where you ended, which is, you know, you, you said you're confident that it comes from bats. And I, that, that seems like what I would say, you know, like as a lay person, essentially, most of the, the articles that you would read suggest, but there's also a there's also a, you know, a set of discussions or, or, or those that have argued that it might be you know, human uh, created. How do we know that this, uh, uh, that COVID-19 was not sort of person made or human made? SARS cov 2 not COVID-19, but anyway, yeah, <laughs> that's okay. It's just a little bit kind of just a thing for me, but um, well, we know Okay, so, the, so people do genealogies or lineages on viruses, and this virus is like 90, I forget, 96% similar to a, 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 a bat virus called RATG13. So it's very closely, it's closely related to SARS, but it's even more closely related to this bat virus. Um, mm. But it's not exactly the bat virus, there's some differences. Um, so uh, it, it really just, from its sequence, it looks like a bat virus. But um, I, I'm, 100% confident that it wasn't man-made because um, you can't, you, you could make a virus, these are RNA viruses, there's no DNA. So the only way to make a new virus would be to convert it into DNA or to synth synthesize DNA of a certain sequence. This is a very, very long, it's the largest RNA genome we know. It's 30 kilobases. I don't know if that means a lot to you, but it's the largest one. It's say three times larger than a polio virus genome or twice as large, two and a half times larger than an influenza. Um, so it, it'd be really impossible to design a virus that was similar to SARS, but different all along the genome. So it's not like it's mm. got chunks of different viruses um, and it doesn't resemble any of the viruses we know that have been cloned and worked on. So, so that, that, would, that alone wouldn't prove it, but the fact that there'd be no way for anyone, diabolical genius as it were, to um, string together the right sequence of RNA to make such a, an awful, such a um, destructive virus. So that's what convinces me. Plus the fact that nobody's, I'd like to, to really believe that it came from somebody. I think you have to sort of show that. You can't just assume that. I think that people that say that don't really understand what it would make, what it would take to do that, to make a virus. So we've got uh, 175 people from the, from the Penn community beyond uh, watching. I'm here with uh, Professor Weiss. And the uh, next question involves, you know, in some ways, maybe you could educate us on why this is so a big deal. You know, why is this virus so virulent? How does it differ from the, the first original SARS or from human coronaviruses that, that say, cause a common cold? Okay, so um, the, the short answer, as I told you, is that we don't, we don't really know that. Um, so SARS, oh, great. 
Yeah. So all the virus, all the human, well, all the coronaviruses have very similar structure in their, in their genetic material. Like two thirds of it is the so-called the genes for replication, and they're very highly conserved among the viruses. Now, we know that small differences in any of those genes could make a, a big difference um, towards the vi about the, the behavior of the virus. But we also know that in the other part of the genome, there are these what we call accessory proteins. And they're, they're, I feel like they almost give each type of coronavirus its uh, personality. And they're, they're, these, vir these proteins often antagonize the host response. So when a virus infects a cell, clearly the host responds in lots of different ways. And one of them is the interferon signaling pathway. That's a very early response. You've probably heard of interferon. It's used to treat MS and other diseases, mm -hmm. antiviral diseases. And these coronaviruses in general have many proteins just designed to stop that from happening. Um, and so, I mean, all the coronaviruses have that. The mouse virus is really good at that, for example. So, um, so to make a longer story short, I mean, SARS-2 and SARS-1 are very similar. They have some small differences in these accessory proteins that may or may not be the cause of, of one being behaving differently from the other. But really, if you look at virulence in the sense of um, killing of mortality, SARS-1 had a higher mortality rate than SARS-2. MERS has even a higher one. So this virus is so well honed that it, it, um, it doesn't kill as many people, but it spreads diabolically from, from asymptomatic or presymptomatic people. And there's no, there's no way for me, or I think anyone, to look at the, um, the genes or the genetic composition and say, yeah, that looks like a really, you know, really bad virus or, or that it's going to spread differently from SARS. That's really, that's one of the things I would like to know from my lab is what are the sort of more subtle differences in how these mm. proteins behave? So here's a question that just came in in the Q&A that's a follow-up to what we were just talking about, which was if, if each virus has its own personality, is there a way to anticipate uh, sort of future coronaviruses? Or you know, how, how should we think about this from a, you know, we are where we are now. Yeah. You know, how should we think about it from a forecasting perspective? Okay, so there's not really a way to predict what the next one's gonna be, although the two really bad ones were both SARS-like viruses. MERS comes from a slightly different, a different bat, um, but still bats. Well, one thing we can do is we can, we can do bat hunting for viruses, virus hunting mm -hmm. in bats, and that's, um, that's something that uh, ha is, has been going on. It was cut off by the government recently by uh, one of the main people doing that had his funding cut off, so that's been pretty controversial. Um, but political for political reasons, I guess. Um, uh, the, but I think more than so, so we can know what the repertoire of viruses is in bats, but it's huge. So we'll never know all, all of them, but we'll know kind of, we kind of know that. Um, but rather than predicting, what we can do is be prepared, better prepared, because um, a lot of the antiviral kind of treatments that are, not, I guess, are being developed, like remdesivir. Um, they're, they're really directed at, at these conserved proteins. So if we get a really good drug for SARS-2, I would predict that it's going to work on future coronaviruses and on the cold viruses. But vaccines are going to be different. Um, people talk about a pan-coronavirus vaccine. Um, people talk about a pan-flu vaccine. We don't have one yet. So um, yeah, so we don't really know that. If, if a virus were to come out similar to this one, then maybe a vaccine would, would work or would like a flu vaccine works again mm. different strains, um, but but if we had if we were armed with some really effective antivirals, maybe that would um, be one way to prepare. So uh, uh, another follow up actually in the in the Q and A asked whether we should assume that that SARS two should we assume that it was around for a long time, but only came to our attention when it jumped from a, a bat you know, eventually, whether through an intermediary or not to a person? Okay. Or is it, is it more likely that this, you know, came about recently as well? You know, that's really a hard thing to answer. Okay. Um, we, we think in the, so there are lots of bat viruses and, and coronaviruses do something interesting. They, they recombine a lot. They have a high, because of the interesting way they replicate their RNA, they're prone to recombining. So there can be all kinds of chain recombinations in bats that generate new viruses all the time. So we don't really know, we don't know if we can actually find an ancestral virus or is it just some recombinant? We don't, we don't know that. We also don't know how long it stays in the intermediate species. We think with, 
for, for just, we think for that the civet was, was not like a, a reservoir for SARS-1, that it was maybe lived in the civet for a short time and then jumped to humans. We know for the camel story is very different from MERS, that it actually lives in camels and the, the camel virus is very similar to the human virus. So it also has to adapt when it moves from one species to another. A lot of times like the bad virus wouldn't actually infect a human. It has to change in it. The spike protein has to change a bit to be able to infect the human. So as far as SARS-2 goes, there's lots of possibilities. It could be a virus that emerged from a bat to a X. They thought it was the pangolin, but I think that's not been proven then to the human. Um, it could have recombined in an intermediate species between two viruses. The other, I guess, possibility is that it could have been in humans longer, but wasn't virulent and then mutated or something. I don't think that's the case, but um, because it's not changing very much in humans, or but it could have changed a bit in humans to become more adapted to humans. So we, we that in the short answer to that is we really, really don't know. There's lots of possibilities about how long it was in each species. So let me let me jump topics uh, a, a little bit. You know, my my original question was about how you knew that it, you know, how do we know it's not sort of person made? And there's a, a follow up in the Q&A asking about another, you know, topic of conversation that we've seen in I want to say global policy discussions or U.S. policy discussions, which is whether this escaped from a lab. Okay, so how do you, then, yeah, how do you how do you think about that that kind of issue? I mean, the you know you, you presumably the, the coronavirus research community, like many, is probably pretty close, and so you you likely know many of these people. Yeah, I I do know not well, but I do know Zheng Li Shi, who's sort of the most famous bat <laughs> coronavirus person in China, and, the, and she her lab is indeed in Wuhan. And Wuhan um, Virology Institute is probably the premier virology in, or one of the premier virology institutes in China. Then they have a BSL-4 there. That's for even higher. So we, there are different levels of biosafety, one, two, three, four. Okay. So SARS-like viruses have to be worked with in BSL-3. They even have a four. That's for like Ebola and stuff like that. So your lab is a three? We have, well, we, our lab is, our lab, our lab would be basically a BSL-2 lab for working for MHV. But when we work with MERS or SARS, we go to another room, which is a BSL-3 ah. room. And it's very carefully, it's very carefully monitored and um, very strict rules. You can't work in that until you've been trained for months. You have to have virus experience for at least a year outside of the BSL-3, then you train in there for months. So um, I don't know the exact rules in China, but I know they have BSL-3, and, and I, I presume that that's how these viruses are worked with in China. I, I, I think it's the same pretty much. I don't know if the rules are exactly the same. So I know that I read that Dr. Xi, when she you know, heard about all this, was um, pretty upset and looked through all her records and couldn't find any virus with, with the same kind of sequence as, as uh, SARS-CoV-2. Um, can, can you imagine how you would feel if you were responsible for that sort of, of thing? So, um, and also the other thing, so I don't think anyone from her lab ever got sick or anyone from, from the virology labs to me. I mean, none of that proves that it didn't come from a lab. But I think it's hard, it's hard to prove a negative. I mean, if, you, if people, if you trust your colleagues and they say, I've never seen that virus in my lab, um, I, I, don't, I, I would sort of challenge someone to prove it did come from the lab rather than that it didn't. Um, so it's really hard to know because there are lots of viruses around. So I wonder if you could maybe, uh, if we could maybe follow up there and tell us a little bit about what, what those safety protocols kind of look like. I mean, uh, let me tell you what the safety protocols of my political science office are, okay. which are like, let's hope I don't trip and hurt myself. The, you know, you, you operate under a different, you know, level of scrutiny, different, different sort of requirements for, for safety. You know, what is it that you all do okay. to ensure that, that things are safe okay, despite so working with such dangerous viruses? Well, I'll tell you first, I'll tell you about BSL-2 first, our ordinary okay. lab. You, 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 um, and this has gotten stricter. We got inspected by CDC when we started working with these viruses. And they, they told us, for example, you can't have plants in the lab. And I don't really understand why. So no sandals, no shorts. Um, you have to wear lab coats and gloves. You have to, the door has to be shut to the lab. No eating, no drinking, none of that kind of stuff. Um, so that's, that's just for a BSL-2 level. And then, you, of course, you work with everything in a biosafety hood. Um, so 
yeah, so, so that's, um, that's sort of BSL-2, that's pretty standard. And that's working with a mouse virus that doesn't infect humans anyway. So th there's mm -hmm. really no issue there. Um, but you can work with, like we work with Zika in that lab as well. So you can work with some human viruses, but Zika is insect borne, so you're not gonna catch Zika easily from the lab. Um, and you're just normal uh, caution with gloves and things like that. And goggles, if you're doing anything that's gonna uh, splatter, anything volatile is in a fume hood and anything infectious is in a tissue culture hood. But then the BSL-3 is a whole other level. So you have to, you, you don't get in there unless you're, uh, unless you're you know, approved for working in there. Um, mm -hmm. You wear uh, kind of a, 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 uh, like a Tyvek suit. Um, you wear uh, a PAPR, which is, you either wear um, an N95, which is a mask, a respirator mask, which has to be fitted. So, so you can't see. We all, we all know what an N95 yeah, is yeah. now, yeah. for better or worse. Yeah, so we're not even using it. So we were using N95s in there. Now we're using PAPRs, which is like a, it blows fresh air. Uh, mm -hmm. So that you're really, it's almost like a, a respirator with a tank. It's much more okay. comfortable than a mask. Uh, I haven't been working in there myself, but my people are working in there. Uh, again, biosafety hood, um, no sharps in there, um, you know, aerosols. You have, you, there's a lot of restrictions what you can. And this is the other thing, anything you do in there. Um, so we, we infect cells in there and then we want to analyze those cells like for protein or RNA or um, but before anything comes out of that, that BSL-3 room, it has to be inactivated. And every single thing, we, every new procedure we use, we have to prove we've inactivated the virus before we can take it out. So it's really quite strict. Everything in there gets autoclaved. Uh, once it goes in, it really can't come out without a whole bunch of uh, decontamination procedures. Um, if the pressure goes down, then you know, the whole thing gets shut down. It, it has to be Every year, there's a major checking of it. Uh, we got inspected by CDC to make sure everything was running properly. A lot of interaction with the environmental health and safety people who have been are really, really good at Penn. I mean, I'm very impressed with them. Um, so yeah, so it's, and if you, here's, this is even crazier. If you work with SARS-1, it's, it's a, called a select agent. Um, and we, we don't, when we were, we had been working with it, and when we were told it became a select agent, we just autoclaved it all. We got rid of it because select agents, every tube has to be accounted for. Mm. Every wow. you, can't, you can't take anything out of the BSL three. I mean, any RNA, any protein, no matter how inactivated, it's so strict that it was prohibitive that we decided not to work with it. For some reason, SARS two and MERS are not select agents, but SARS one is arbitrary. So let me, if, if you don't mind, I want to ask a follow-up question that actually shifts from your lab into, um, what do we say, the laboratory of the world. Okay. And that, you know, we've, you know, we're all, you know, in, in the United States, you know, it's been different in other countries, uh, you know, experiencing, you know, wearing masks, you know, frequent use, frequent hand washing, hand sanitizer, uh, et cetera. Given what you know about how the virus operates and mutates and, and you know, work in your own lab, you know, how, how should we be thinking about things like masks, sanitizer, hand washing, you know, all those sorts of things for, you know, for, for times when we do have to go out into the world? Yeah, well, I'm not a clinician or an epidemiologist, but I know, I know, I know, I know. But I'm just saying, I personally think um, it's important to do those things. Um, I go out every morning on either on a bike ride or a walk and I take a mask, but I don't wear it because there's nobody out on the streets at six o'clock in the morning. But if I see a bunch of people, I put it on. Um, I went to work a couple days finally, and, I, and there everybody's wearing a mask. And um, it's lots of hand sanitizer at the entrance to each building. I think that's really important that you sanitize, that you wash your hands, that you wear a mask, um, that you stay six feet apart. Yeah, I, I mean, from my knowledge, I think that's true. I mean, it's in, it, the virus is a respiratory virus. Um, I don't think that you get a whole lot of virus from touching stuff. I think you'd have to have a lot of virus put down on the surface to, to pick it up, but it's possible. I think there are very few like known transmissions from like wiping your hand on a surface. Um, I think that what I've been reading is the, that, that you really need like 15 minutes of contact with somebody to, wow. to okay. get it. although you know you don't want to take your chances so you don't really right. know so i want to ask a, a follow-up that is about you know going back to a, a previous question about it gets to sort of basic science and in cooperation 
in that, you know, at, at Perry World House, our focus tends to be you know, global affairs and, you know, interactions between, you know, countries, NGOs, companies, um, you know, those, those, some of those sorts of things. And, you know, obviously the, the uh, outbreak of this pandemic has led to a lot of tension between countries uh, around the world, particularly the United States and China, uh, also tension with the, with the World Health Organization. As a, as a leading basic researcher who's been working on, on coronaviruses for, for decades, what is cooperation at the science level like? Is it, does it reflect those, those sort of international tensions or is, or is, it about, is it about relationships? Like, how does that work? I think it's, I think it's um, much nicer than whatever is going on between the governments. Um, I personally have had a whole string of Chinese um, trainees in my lab, both postdocs who have been amazingly good and well-trained. They also have a program, um, I, I don't know what's gonna happen now, but it's a Chinese uh, visitors program really where they come, students, postdocs, faculty can come for a year and work in a lab at, at, in the US and they're paid for by the Chinese government. And I've had three or four of these people that have been really, uh, really wonderful. And, they become friends. So I personally have had amazingly good interactions with, um, with trainees from China. And in fact, um, I think I told you this when we talked earlier that I have a bunch of masks that my former, my former postdoc's a professor now in Wuhan and he sent us a bunch of masks because he was worried about me. So um, it's been, uh, that's been really good. I've, we've been to China a couple times. I've been to meetings there. So there's a lot of interaction between um, Chinese and American scientists. I mean, recently there's been tension about how much American, science, American scientists can do in China, like have uh, labs there or grants there. And that's been a big tension about uh, conflicts of interest and sharing of funds and things like that. But I mean, most Americans that have interacted with Chinese scientists are, are not in that category. They're just um, interactions and um, we, we have meetings that we go to Chinese meetings, they come here. I've been just involved in um, meetings uh, in Cold Spring Harbor. We're having a series of meetings on coronavirus and we have people mm -hmm. from all over the world, Europe and Asia uh, coming to these meetings. And I'm gonna be speaking at a meet. I just spoke at a meeting in Be virtually in Beijing. And um, so yeah, there's been a lot of interaction, particularly with China actually. So I think, I think the tension's at a, a different level. So how can you, can you maybe educate us a little bit on how does that kind of cooperation between scientific researchers, how does that help with progress toward, uh, toward understanding, uh, toward understanding, you know, say this virus, uh, you know, future viruses, et cetera? Well, I mean, there are people, I mean, there are, the number of labs now working on SARS-CoV-2 is just amazing. Everyone's working on SARS, at this institution alone, Everybody, not I shouldn't say everybody, but a vast number of labs that worked on other topics have converted to to working on this virus from and, and the clinicians working on clinical aspects, the basic scientists on basic aspects, and that's happening all over the world. So it's not like China and U.S. cooperate in a specific way, but everybody's hmm. getting together. I've been on a phone call this morning from NIH has people from all over the world presenting their data, sharing their ideas. The other thing that's happened now is. Um, there's a there's something called bio archives. It's like a way to uh, to submit your paper, your manuscripts before they're reviewed. And so okay. uh, so like and there's a big banner that says this has not been reviewed yet. So there's there's tons of information now pre review it hasn't been peer reviewed. So you have to read it with a grain of salt um, of information being shared before it's even published. So that's that's that was existed before SARS-CoV-2, but it's just huge now. If you look in there, you'll just find hundreds of papers. So huge interactions um, in, of um, sharing information. Um, yeah, I mean, I guess that's really the way it's done. And then of course, particular people have specific in collaborations with labs in China or anywhere. I mean, I've collaborated with people in Europe lots of times. Um, yeah. Sure, well, so let me ask a follow-up that just came in in the, in the Q&A that says, one of the things that makes this interesting, at least from my point of view in the medical field, is that the connection between clinical and research is very close. Doctors in the ER are testing and researching as patients come in. Is this impacting your work as a, in, in you know, thinking about the translational link between 
you know, your lab and then, then clinicians working on, you know, working with patients? Um, to me, my lab is really basic science. So we really study the virus, the individual genes, what they do in a very reductionist tissue culture kind of way. But we have been involved um, at the beginning, we were very involved with helping clinicians figure out how to inactivate virus. Like, like what is, like how much virus is in blood or urine or any of these uh, fluids and, and how do you inactivate it so you can do other assays. So you can look at cytokine response or, you know, so-called cytokine storms or antibody response or any of those kinds of things. So we were very involved with helping people to do that. We also, the other thing we've done is we've isolated viruses from uh, patient samples. Um, which we, we may look at later and see how the virus is changing over time, for example. Um, but but um, I'm trying to, so a lot of the immunologists have been really involved mm -hmm. with understanding the immune response um, in, in, in patients with, with COVID-19. Um, me, not so much, but, but in a more basic way of, of sort of technology and inactivation of the virus. So, I, so I think it's an incredible cooperation. I know, I'm sorry, go ahead. No, no, no. Um, no, continue if you. That was all I was going to say. Um, the so can you maybe tell us a little bit more about about your lab and, and what you were what you were working. I guess like two aspects to this sort of one. You know what were what were you working on before the pandemic, and you know has that changed at all? And two is you know how does it feel as someone that's been working on this issue for decades that you know that all of a sudden. Uh, all of a sudden it's everywhere and everybody has an opinion. Yeah, well, first I'll tell you that because it's, kind of, it's kind of amazing. Um, like I said, to see your virus, this is something I've been thinking about for 40 years. It's just like, part of me, it's my research field. It's, it's, you know, it's, just, it's just there. So to start seeing it, everybody, first of all, knowing what a coronavirus was, and I've been um, asked by, I've talked to, I, I can't even tell you how many different uh, reporters and uh, news people in, in Denmark, in Germany, every, all over the world, wanting to know about the, the basic science of the virus, which is the thing I really know. I really know the basic um, biology of the virus. And also wanting to know, was it man-made? Was it, you know, all that kind of conspiracy theory stuff. So it's really pushed me up into this amazing, uh, weird, weird and amazing place. I was got to be in a round table in the New York Times Magazine. I got to do all kinds of things. I National Academy of Science presentation. So for me, it's just been kind of amazing. Plus having all kinds of interesting collaborations with people at Penn um, on various basic science projects. So, so it's been, but then it's very sobering to think this is all because of this, you know, this horrible pandemic that people are dying from. Um, so to my lab in a way, so what we were doing before this all happened is we were probably the closest to working on this, of, well, certainly of anyone at Penn, but we were working on MERS coronavirus and mouse hepatitis virus. And we were doing these studies on, you know, how do these individual genes affect the host response, very, um, you know, going at our usual pace. And then all of a sudden SARS-CoV-2 comes out and um, we switched. I mean, we didn't stop. Well, yeah, we pretty much moved to, to doing, helping other, other people doing all this, helping the clinicians, figuring out all this basic stuff. I got the virus within days. I mean, it usually mm. would take, wow. get, to get a virus like this, you have yeah, to- what is that, what is that compared to normal? Well, it could take weeks. I mean, okay. to, get, to get, to work with a virus like this, this is a part of the BSL-3 thing. You have to be BSL-3 approved to even get the virus. Then you have to get an imp what they call a CDC import permit, like permission from CDC, because they track all this stuff to get the virus. Um, and we got it from an organization called BEI, which got it from CDC. And um, so the paperwork, I was in Europe at a meeting, actually the virus meeting when all this broke and my EHRS person helped me, that's the, the health and safety people, biosafety people, helped me get all this permit stuff done so that I, within days I had a, an order in to get the virus and it came maybe a week later, which was amazing. This was, it was, this was the isolate from the person in Washington, that very early case in, in Washington. Right. This virus was deposited, we got the virus, we learned how to grow it up. Very, so that's what we did in the beginning. Like there were four people in my lab that were B, BSL-3 certified. They just started working. Everybody else had to stop working. You could only work on quote COVID-19. So 
um, or really people, it was looser than that because people worked on other viruses. So, 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 so it completely changed our lab and everybody was, you know, a lot of anxiety, a lot of pressure, a lot of, and I was sequestering at home because I was older and um, I was managing everything from home. I just started to go back to work. Um, so yeah, so it changed a lot. Now, uh, I just came from my student's thesis committee meeting. So she's got to focus now again on finishing her MERS and MHV work while we um, finish up. We're going to try to publish a paper on our SARS work. Uh, so yeah, everything changed. And for, for other labs, even more so. I mean, labs that never touched right. coronavirus are doing this. Uh, I don't know how long it's going to last, how long the research piece of it's going to last. So one question, a couple questions coming through the Q&A. So I want to switch gears a little bit and get back into the virus uh, itself. And there are a couple of, uh, a couple of questions in the Q&A asking about different strains of the virus and specifically the, the case that, that China has made that there's a, a different strain of the virus in the U.S. and in Europe than there was in, in China, uh, than there was in China uh, originally. What do you what do you make of uh, what do you make of some of those uh, claims? The uh, I mean the very specific question then gets into the Beijing uh, the recent sort of report of an outbreak in in Beijing and whether the Beijing outbreak is the and I'm going to try to read this correctly the D614G mutation. Okay. Okay. Uh, but I mean th look that is well beyond my personal scientific knowledge. Like I think the broader question for us is, uh, you know. Is it, you know, is it true that there are multiple strains already? And, you know, how, how should we be thinking about that? Okay, so I don't, I don't think there are multiple strains in the sense that there are multiple flu strains that are, that are like not going to be uh, affected by, uh, like a vaccine won't recognize another strain. So I, I think there's really one strain. I don't, there are clearly variations. So all viruses, all coronaviruses, but all viruses slowly change. They get mutations in them and, and, and it doesn't usually mean very much, but if they happen to be some ad, um, adaptive advantage, um, then, then that mutation may be preserved and may, uh, may take over kind of. But I think so far for, for this virus, like the New York virus is going to be slightly different from the California virus, from the Europe virus. Okay. So the virus in Philly is probably, is, seems to be similar to the New York virus. And all that means is there's some different, I mean, different protein. Can we say that the New York virus is similar to the Philly virus? Rather yeah, right, 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 right. <laughs> Actually, it was in New York first. I'm a New Yorker, so. <laughs> um, but anyway, um, be that as is made. But, but this D1, this mutation that that person mentioned, the D to G mutation. So that mutation seems to be um, very common. I think we saw it in the viruses isolated from patients at Penn. And it's, um, it's in a lot of people. Um, and there's a lot of, a lot of uh, speculation about what it could mean, but so far, in, as far as I can tell, no one's shown anything except that it seems to be becoming, becoming a common uh, feature of viruses. I, somebody has to, and I, I, somebody has to take that mutation, put it isolated, put it into a new virus, a recombinant virus, compare it to the wild type virus and ask, what change does it really make? It's not in a part of the spike that you would necessarily say, you know, it's a really important, like if it's in the, if it were in the part of the spike that binds to the receptor, you might really suspect it's got an important function, but we don't really know what it means. Um, and as I said, it does seem to be the one mutation that is becoming more predominant or more common, but there's a lot of speculation about it. I, I would highly doubt it's going to make a difference in, like, re in responding to a vaccine or something like that, or to an antibody. So uh, I, I know that you don't work on vaccines, but we've got a lot of questions okay. in the Q&A about vaccines. Okay, I can try. So, and I'm sure you know more about vaccines than I do. Probably. So maybe could you tell us about at least what your understanding is about maybe some of the progress or, or lack thereof being made toward a vaccine, toward a vaccine and you know, what, what you see as the most likely outcome? Okay, so there are something like 70 vaccines being un being developed now and a certain number of them were chosen for funding to to go forward and i know that you know the, uh, and i'll tell you maybe there are different types of vaccines and i know that they're going to be this is unusual people are building factories to make vaccines even before we have the vaccines because right. 
want to be really ready when, when, one, when one vaccine or one or more vaccine is tested and, and proves to be a good one. So we have, um, so most of the vaccine development is focused on the spike protein. So there are two kinds of vaccines, two, okay. many kinds of vaccines, but you could either have a vaccine that's based on the whole virus, and that could either be an inactivated vaccine, like a soft vaccine for polio, or you could have a live attenuated vaccine, like the Sabin vaccine. And both of those have been, been talked about and maybe not, there don't seem to be the most popularized ones right now. Uh, because you always worry about an attenuated vaccine reverting to being virulent, although there are ways to really attenuate or make this a less virulent virus that would still evoke an immune response. So that's the idea with that vaccine. Um, I like that idea because it presents all the viral proteins in a kind of natural way and the immune response would be kind of natural. The other, the other major class is to, is to vaccinate against the spike protein, the whole spike okay. protein, that's the attachment protein, or what we call the receptor binding domain, or you might've heard of the RBD. The RBD is a piece of the spike protein that actually attaches to the receptor. So some vaccines are gonna be directed against the RBD and some against the spike. And the idea is to, to, to prevent the virus spike from mediating entry into the cell. And so now we have these, um, so there's several different ways of doing that. Um, one is the so-called Oxford vaccine, which is one of the popular ones, um, one of the ones being pushed forward and being tested now. And it's a spike protein that's um, given uh, in the form of an adenovirus. It's another uh, cold virus. Okay. Adenoviruses would be expected not to have an effect on the, on the vaccinated person and it presents the spike protein in a virus. So it's replicating and making a lot of spike and you immune response to it. The other two um, are the DNA and the RNA vaccines. I think everyone's heard of the Moderna vaccine. That's, there was some very early data suggesting it was working. And these right. vaccines, again, they're either RNA or DNA, um, nucleic acids that then have to are put into the body and then the body has to make the protein from the, back, from the RNA or DNA. Um, and the, so there's never been any, I guess there are no, there's no history of either one of those techniques producing a vaccine, but that's partially because they're relatively new techniques. So we really don't know. And we hope that one, of the, one or more of these um, will work. So that, that's kind of uh, basically where it's, where it's going now. So the Moderna is under uh, being tested. And I think the uh, adenovirus vaccine is also being tested. And uh, I've just heard people say that, uh, I forget, maybe it was Fauci or someone that by the end of the year, we should have, we should know uh, how well these vaccines work. So turning back to the, the last question, uh, there's a, a question in the, in the Q&A uh, asking about uh, mutations and uh, sort of a clarifying question asking, you know, it, you know, quote, it sounds like we haven't seen any significant functional mutations. Yes. Is, 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 that, is that correct? I think that I would say that's correct. Unless we can see that this D to G mutation really has a function, um, I think that's true. That's correct. Oh, there, there are some, there, there's, a, there's an, um, something I'm interested. There's a, one of the small proteins, ORP8, um, is getting in, in Singapore, they're finding big deletions in that protein, but nobody knows if it means anything. So, yeah. So here's a, uh, let, me, let me turn in a slightly different direction, which is there are a couple of questions in the Q&A that uh, basically wondering um, if, if coronaviruses in some ways were, were relatively neglected compared to their importance, you know, prior to, you know, and then this pandemic has certainly, certainly demonstrated that, what else are we missing? So are there, uh, are there other, uh, you know, types of viruses out there or other, or other aspects? I mean, obviously, arguably nothing has ever received the attention that coronaviruses are receiving, you know, at, like right at this particular moment. But where else should we be looking for for future areas that maybe are being, you know, underfunded now, or where there's not enough uh, attention being paid? Well, you know, that's so hard to know. And in, in, uh, how right. is twenty twenty, right? Um, I mean, certainly, I, I think virus hunting in bats is an important thing to do because bats are also um, a reservoir for uh, Ebola and Marburg and. You know, hmm. the um, Wait, so Nipa had lots of virus. Can I interrupt for one second? Yeah. Why bats? Well, that's, a, well that's, a, that's something that lots of people are trying to figure out. Well, for, for one thing, there are like, I don't know the numbers, but there are so many species of bats. There are just like millions of species of bats and millions of viruses. 
And there's a whole lot of um, specul. Well, I shouldn't say there's a lot of data coming out now onto why. So one of the re one of the thoughts is that bats have um, a sort of different innate immune system. So they somehow they can they um, they can tolerate they coexist with the viruses can coexist with the bats without making them sick. That so they have just enough innate immunity that keeps the virus down but doesn't completely eradicate it. So that's one idea that that they yeah that that there's some they have a their physiology allows them to. Um, to coexist better with bats than, than some other species. Um, but it is pretty interesting. I mean, no, and the proximity, so the proximity of humans, like, so in China, they have these, uh, these wet markets, they call them, right. with, with live animals. And so that's an easy way for the bat to transmit to the animal, to the human. So that proximity of humans with bats in nature um, is, is one of the issues that allows this uh, zoonotic transmissions, which seems to be a theme of a lot of these bad viruses coming from animals. So, um, yeah, I don't know which virus. I mean, I, I personally think that, you know, we, we pay a lot of lip service to funding basic science that we say, right. yeah, basic science is really important. We really have to start from the beginning. Um, but somehow it doesn't quite happen uh, I mean, like, you know, like now, of course, it's really important to fund vaccine and drug development and all that, but we shouldn't forget that, you know, that, that we don't know what the next virus is going to be. So we should be funding research on Ebola or what well, we do, but on whatever group of viruses that, um, I mean, I think for coronaviruses, SARS should have been a really good wake up call. And it was somewhat, but not, not enough. So here's a, here's a follow up uh, on that, which is, uh, why are we not trying to figure out what immunities bats have and isolate it and use it against these viruses or, or, or are we? Okay, well, first of all, we are trying to figure out what the okay. immunity in bats is. I, I actually have a collaborator in uh, Colorado, Tony Schaunt, okay. who has a bat colony. And, Whoa, uh, okay. Yeah, and I, I saw it, you go in there and they're like, flapping around like this. Um, and he has a BSL-3 bat colony. So, and he's infects them with, with viruses like, um, like MERS and SARS, and he, one of his, he is an immunologist, so yeah, he, he and others are trying to figure out what the immune response is. I don't know that you can necessarily translate that into humans, but, um, but we, we would, we do learn something from it, like what is, so my lab, for example, we, we work on a pathway called RNA cell, and we actually compared the human pathway to the bat, bat pathway in bat cells, and for this particular pathway, we didn't find a whole lot of differences, but people are finding differences in some other types of immune responses that, that may be responsible. The other interesting thing is in bats, these viruses are mostly enteric. They're GI viruses. They're found in bat poop all the time. That's how we mm. discover them. Whereas in humans, they're respiratory. So that's kind of just a interesting. Um, yeah. So uh, here's a question asking for, uh, you know, help us, help us help ourselves and be more educated that, that asks, you know, for, you know, you know, people that, uh, you know, in theory are smart, but, you know, are not, say, world-leading experts on coronaviruses. Can you, can you recommend, so, you know, what are sources of information that we should be, be looking to to try to understand this when we, you know, like when we don't have you on speed dial? Um, there's lots of stuff lately in the New York Times. Um, you mean, you mean textbooks or more just, um, no, you more might... to, like places to get updates on what's going on that we should be, I mean, it might be that there's enough in the New York Times that like, that's where uh, we should be looking. But if you want to know what's going on. Well, Johns Hopkins has a really nice site of where they update a lot of information about coronavirus and mortality, morbidity, mortality, uh, WHO. So, you know, if you want to get the clinical or the mortality and spread kind of stuff, CDC, WHO, this Hopkins site. If you want to learn about the viruses, um, depends what level you want to do it. I mean, there are textbooks that'll tell you about it, but um, uh, I think I think there's a lot in the popular pre press lately. I mean, there's things in the Atlantic. I mean, every just about every kind of magazine or journal has articles about this stuff on it. Um, there's a the, the round table I did not to advertise on New York Times a couple of weeks ago. It was I read um, it. it. I read it. Yeah. I would highly recommend it. Yeah, it was really good. It, I mean, I was the least vocal person there, but it was about vaccines. It was led by uh, Sid Arthur Mukherjee, and it had some really um, leading vaccine developing type people in it. So I would recommend going back and finding that. You can find it on on the on uh, by Googling, I'm sure. 
And for actually for, you know, we've got about uh, 180 people on and in the in the chat, I just dropped a link to the Hopkins webpage as well as to the New York Times wow. um, uh, magazine piece. So you can uh, you can check those uh, you can check those off uh, as well. So uh, let me ask a uh, there's a there's a, a, a very technical question technical enough that I don't even know we've got about 10 minutes okay. left here. I, I don't even really understand exactly what it means, but uh, I suspect you are which is how did gain of function research affect uh, uh, SARS-2? Okay, so I don't know about SARS-2, but originally gain of function means that, so we can make rec what we call recombinant viruses, which means okay. we can mutate, we sort of make it into DNA, then we can make mutations in it um, and then see the effect of the mutations. So the kind of mutations that we make in our lab is we, we will usually attenuate or make the virus weaker. Um, so there was a ban for a while on making mutations, well, we're not allowed to make mutations that cause gain of function. Like in other words, you're not allowed to put a gene in a, in a virus that's going to make it more virulent or more infectious. And so for a while, there was a ban on making a lot of mutants in flu, mm. SARS, and, uh, I can't, and MERS, and I can't remember if there are any other viruses. So um, every time somebody wanted to make a virus, they had to get permission from NIH for each specific virus because of this fear of gain of function. I mean, like making a, like recreating a flu virus that would be, uh, you know, like super virulent is not allowed. So that's what that means. I don't know that um, anything's, you know, or, or taking a bat virus and putting a gene in that'll allow it to infect humans. I don't know anything specifically that happened for SARS-CoV-2, but. Um, but there is pretty strict regulation of making viruses that might have gain of function. And that became a big political issue for a while. Okay. The, so let me, let me get, let me get bigger uh, in that several times you brought up the, the importance of basic research. And, you know, obviously as a, as a faculty member, I agree with you that basic research is really important. Uh, can you maybe uh, tell us a little bit about about why you think funding basic research? I mean, obviously, like you know, I, it's easy for people to grasp now, like why we should have spent more in the study. Right. Of but you know, well, what's the what's the gain for for basic research, and you know, why do we need to be spending more money on? Okay, so I mean, I I just can go. We don't know what the next epidemic is going to be, and we don't know what we know. We don't know what we need to know to prepare, basically. So I can just tell you, we can only look backwards and say, um, if we hadn't known the, the root, so this vi these viruses enter the cell by two different routes. And if we didn't understand that, and, and, and depending on which route is used, would tell you a lot about um, how, to, how to target for, for drug therapy. So if we didn't know the route that the virus entered, we wouldn't know what drugs might or might not work. The same thing for all these, pro these conserved proteins I was talking about. If we want to design a pan-coronavirus inhibitor, we have to know what, what proteins to direct it against. So all these things, and, and even on a simpler level, if we didn't know the sequence of the virus, we never would have identified SARS or, or, or SARS-2 or MERS. If we didn't know a lot about the viruses, we would have been fumbling around for a long time. When SARS first came out, there, people thought it was a human metanuma virus. They thought right. it was there were all kinds of mischaracterizations about it. So it, we need to know really clearly how these viruses work. So if we do see a new one, we can very quickly figure out what it is um, and, and hopefully have some kind of way to, to think about therapies or vaccines. So yeah, that's the reason. So, so building in some ways from basic to, uh, to apply. You know, what is the relationship between basic research and say, you know, the development of pharmaceuticals or development of vaccines? Or, you know, what's the relationship between academia and industry? Okay, so oh. there's a lot of different combinations for that. Like um, some industry- Different models, you mean, for how to do it? Different models, yeah. I mean, sometimes uh, basic science stuff is, um, is adapted by, um, by a company or an industry, or there's a collaboration or there's some funding there. Sometimes basic, uh, some biotech or pharmaceutical companies will have a biotech wing that, I mean, I know like people at Merck are doing kind of basic stuff to, to, for this virus. One of my former technicians is there. Um, or, um, or, or like somebody might get funded. I, I know I've been approached by a lot of small, uh, small biotech companies 
to who don't have BSL three labs to help us do some testing of mm, their okay. antibodies or drugs like that. So there's a lot of different a lot of different models that 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 works by. All right, so. So uh, we've got just a couple minutes left, and so I have, I have two questions left for you. And the, uh, the first uh, goes back to just something that you know, related to something we've talked about, some of the things we've talked about, about, you know, sort of funding for the future, vaccines, you know, sort of things like that. If, uh, if things are going well, say, over the next, you know, four, five, six months, what should we be looking for? You know, since, you know, we're, we're looking at, at, you know, watching press conferences and looking at press releases and, you know, maybe some of us are looking at scientific journals, but, you know, obviously not following things as close uh, as you are. What are the sort of signposts and indicators that would, that would tell us whether, hey, there's a lot of scientific progress being made versus like, this is not going well. This is what I always look at. Like, look for data. I know, I, I don't mean okay. like reading the scientific journals, but like if you read an article in the New York Times and it says that, um, you know, this vaccine looks like it's working and they say well, they had, four, they measured four patients. I, I, I want to see more than that. You know, right. it, it kind of happens that way sometimes or, or you, or remdesivir that it looks like it's working. I mean, really read it carefully and see what does it really do? I mean, does it really save lives? Does it really prevent ventilators? Does it, um, does it have to be used IV versus orally? You know, just try to read the details. Like, I always hear from my mother always tells me they say this or that, you know, but don't go by they say this or that, like look for the actual information. I think that's the most, and listen to Tony Fauci. I think he's probably the most up on all this kind of stuff of anyone in the country. And I think he, he tells it straight like it is. Yeah. And the, and so sorry, let me squeeze one more question in before I, before I take you out of the question we're asking, we're asking everybody, but, uh, so yeah, how, how is somebody like you thinking about, about uh, you know, Tony Fauci obviously is somebody that I think, you know, none of us really knew, uh, none, none of us are excluding you, uh, really, really knew about prior to this, but all of a sudden is very famous uh, in the United States. So you view him as a as sort of very trustworthy source. Yeah, actually, I want to say, I mean, maybe you're, I mean, he was super important during the, the HIV that's, epidemic. That's true. So I think people do know him for that, or some people do know him for that. He should be known for that. He's just, um, yeah, I totally respect him and trust him. And uh, he's a scientist too. I mean, he has a lab at NIH. He worked on HIV himself. I, he's, an, I believe, an immunologist. So yeah. Well, great. Well, we've got we've got time for one more question, and it's the same question, you know, just about that we ask uh, everybody in the in this World uh, Today series <laughs> we've done on on COVID nineteen and the future of the world, and that is, let's imagine things go well. And I want I want to take us on an optimistic note. So let's let's imagine that things go well, and we look back in a, in a in a year, two years, three years, and we say, you know, that was horribly bad, but it could have been worse. It could have gone a lot worse. You know, we, we got things together and a lot of good progress was made. Yeah. What do you think are the chances that we end up in that better case scenario? And you know, what do we need to do to get there? Uh, I think we need a vaccine. <laughs> I think if we have an effective vaccine that it will really uh, calm things down. I mean, if we, ha if we could get a, um, some antivirals in the, in the meantime to sort of uh, mitigate the amount of death from this virus, that would be hugely helpful. But I, I think, of, I mean, I think most experts would say that uh, a vaccine is really is really the, the 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 best thing. I mean, yeah. I, since this virus isn't changing like every well, we don't know. I don't think it's going to radically change from year to year. So okay. probably if we get a good vaccine that works, it'll work. It'll keep it'll keep us for a while. We might have to get revaccinated or something like that. But I think that that's looking back. I think that would be the best thing to say. Well, we got that vaccine and now we're we're okay. That's that's. All right. my optimistic view. Well, thanks for that. And, and thanks to everyone who's joined in for our, our conversation with Professor Susan Weiss, who a uh, world leading expert on coronaviruses uh, here at the, at the University of Pennsylvania. You know, thank you, Professor Weiss, for, for educating us and you know, teaching me and, and I think probably everybody else a lot about you know, what it is we're dealing with in this pandemic and, and where things uh, might head. So, so thank you very much for joining us today. Yeah, thank you. I, I really enjoyed di different kind of questions from a different kind of audience. Absolutely. And, you know, thanks to everybody tuning in at home. And our, our next event will be uh, July 7th. And we'll be, we're going to take a, take a week off. And our next event will be 
uh, very different. It will be, uh, we're actually gonna, we're moving a little away from, from the focus on COVID to talking about forging a global green recovery. That'll be uh, with uh, Billy Fleming, who directs the McCarg Center here uh, at Penn, and Musanda Mumba, the chief of the Terrestrial Ecosystems Unit at a uh, UN uh, environment. So I uh, hope everybody uh, will tune in for that uh, event as well. And, and thank, join me again in thanking uh, Professor Weiss for doing uh, such a tremendous job uh, teaching us all about coronaviruses. Thank you. Have a great day, everybody. Bye.